welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at molar pregnancy. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Drop a like if you haven't, drop a comment, share the page as well. Today we're going to be looking at molar pregnancies, which are correctly or more accurately termed gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Remember that this is going to be an abnormal proliferation of placental tissue that's going to be involving the cytotrophoblast as well as the syncytial trophoblast. Remember that the cytotrophoblast is responsible for creation or making up of the chorionic villi, while the cytotrophoblast is responsible for the production of the hormone beta-ACG. So remember that this trophoblast is naturally invasive, but the invasion normally stops after the placentation has happen or has occurred. So when we're talking about gestational trophoblastic neoplasia or GTN, this is just going to be an abnormal proliferation of this trophoblastic tissue that's often going to lead to massive placental overgrowth, occasional invasion, as well as rarely metastasis. So there is some chance of it actually transforming into a malignancy and it may become a choriocarcinoma, which is a malignant tumor. And remember that all these uh, type of tumors, the gestational trophoblastic neoplasms, are going to be producing beta human chorionic gonadotrophin or beta HCG. And this means that it makes it a very useful tool for, for actually monitoring the treatment of the disease as well as screening for recurrence of the disease. So when you have persistent gestational trophoblastic disease where an individual has persistently raised beta HCG, we refer to that as a gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. There are pretty much four types of neoplasms. We'll go into detail when we talk about the hydatid to deform moles, which can either be complete or partial. We'll talk about invasive moles in passing, as well as gestational choriocarcinomas that will come later on, and placental site trophoblastic tumors that we will also talk about. So we'll begin with benign gestational trophoblastic neoplasms. These are also known as HIDA TD4 moles. You can call them H moles. You can refer to them as the molar pregnancy. They can also be called as a vesicular molar. So here, or vesicular mole rather. Here there's going to be a degenerative as well as proliferative changes that are going to be happening in the young chorionic villi. And remember that these changes are going to result in formation of these small cysts of varying sizes. So they look like grapes. And because of its superficial resemblance to this hydatid cysts, which can be found in the body when you have an infection, that's how they're referred to as hydatid form mole, because they look like hydatid cyst. And they are the most common type of gestational trophoblastic neoplasms. And we can further classify them or categorize them on basis of the gross morphology, on the histopathology, as well as the karyotype of the mole. And however, unless specified, molar pregnancies are usually uh, used to relate to as complete moles. So some risk factors include age. So the prevalence is highest in teenage pregnancies. So people below the age of 20, as well as women above the age of 35 years. And the race, so it's prevalent, uh, appears in, the, uh, this prevalence in varying uh, races is very different, as well as in ethnic origins, but it's very common in the Philippines, as well as in the Taiwan. So you also have faulty nutrition, so people that have inadequate intake of proteins, animal fat could partially explain the prevalence in oriental countries. Then you could also have a low dietary intake of carotene, has been associated with an increased risk. Even folate deficiency has been associated with an increased risk. You also have some maternal immune dysfunction, like for example, when there's a rise in gamma globulin levels in the absence of hepatic disease. It is also an increase in association with AB blood group, which uh, possess no ABO antibodies. There is another risk factor, which is having uh, had a prior high density form more in a previous pregnancy, increases the chance of it recurring by about 1-4%. to 4%. There are two types of benign hydatid form moles. There is a complete mole or a complete hydatid form mole and an incomplete hydatid form mole. So we shall begin by talking about a complete hydatid form mole. This is actually the most common type of benign gestational trophoblastic neoplasms. And how do these actually arise? So you're going to be having, remember that when fertilization is supposed to be taking place, there's supposed to be an ovum that's meeting a sperm. Remember that the sperm has 23 sets of chromosomes the ovum has 23 sets of chromosomes so when these come together they should make 46 uh, chromosomes but in this case of a complete mole you have uh, an egg that has um, 
no DNA within it, or the DNA may be inactivated such that it gets fertilized by a normal sperm. So it means that all the DNA that is going to be present in the zygote is going to be coming from the, the father. So it's going to be partenal DNA. So in 90%, there's going to be some duplication of this uh, DNA that's coming from the sperm. So it's going to be haploid. And then in 10%, the, sometimes you may have two um, spermatozoa fertilizing an empty egg. So you refer to that as dispermic uh, type. So usually you may have an XY, so it's going to be fertilizing an empty ovum. Then, of course, when you examine this woman and you actually look at the ultrasound, you're going to see that there's no fetus in the uterus. So it's going to be a complete mole. It's not going to be a human. There is going to be no umbilical cord. There won't be any amniotic fluid that you're going to be seeing. And usually the uterus is going to be filled with these grape-like vesicles that are going to be composed of edematous avascular villi. And patients usually present between 8 to 24 weeks of gestation. And most of the patients are going to come in with a history of vaginal bleeding, plus or minus them passing these grape-like tissues uh, uh, from the vagina. The uterus is often soft and doughy, and it's going to be large for dates. So you'll, you'll get a history of a woman that is coming in maybe at eight weeks, but then the uterus looks like as if they are at 16 weeks. And of course, there may be other features of other diseases such as preeclampsia, early onset preeclampsia, because of this increase in beta ACG levels. There may be a hyperemesis gravidarum, cardiac failure, hyperthyroidism. Remember, these are all related to beta HCG. Remember, HCG has a similar structure structure to TSH and um, the alpha subunit of these hormones are very similar such that beta HCG can bring about the features of TSH so it's, it will be like as if this woman has a lot of TSH in the body and it's causing these features of hypertension especially before 20 weeks it may cause these features of excessive vomiting the early morning um, excessive morning sickness that's associated with these conditions on ultrasound you may see a snowstorm appearance but this is a term that was used in the older scans that used to be done way back. So on the real-time scans of the cavity, you may see what is known as a homogeneous solid tissue with vesicular appearance. Sometimes there may be this multiple luteal cysts in the ovaries, and this is often due to the high levels of beta ACG that are stimulated in the ovaries. And 20% of the times, it may progress to malignancy. So remember, the complete mole can arise from two different scenarios where you have an empty ovum being fertilized by one egg and then the DNA, I mean, being fertilized by one sperm and then the DNA that's there is paternal in origin, it duplicates. So it's going to be haploid. And then on the other side, you can have an empty egg being fertilized by two different um, spermatozoa. Remember, when fertilization happens, there's supposed to be a membrane that's forming, quote unquote, a membrane that's forming this fertilized ovum to prevent further fertilization from the other spermatozoa. So here is an example of the snowstorm appearance. As you can see, there are these vesicle-like structures which are present in this whole structure here. So this is an ultrasound. Then with the incomplete hydrated uniform mode, this is the less common variant of the benign gestational trophoblastic neoplasms. So here you're going to have um, the affected coriovili, which is focal, and they will be a fetus, and or at least they may be an amniotic a sac because this is an incomplete mole. You haven't yet ruined everything totally. So you get uh, a situation where two normal uh, spermatozoa are going to be fertilizing one normal egg, such that now this person will have three times the amount of uh, or an extra set of chromosomes. So they have 69 chromosomes. So it could have a carrier type of XXY, it could be XYY, or it could be XXX, where you have one maternal uh, chromo set of chromosomes and two paternal haploid sets of chromosomes. So when you do a microscopic examination, you're going to find that there's dilatation of the chorionic villi, which is obviously going to be hyperplasia of the syncytial trophoblast, and there's going to be presence of blood vessels with fatal red blood cells. You may have a fetus and umbilical cord and amniotic fluid that's going to be seen. And this is obviously going to be resulting in fetal demise during the first trimester. And rarely, the baby may be born and actually... Uh, there may be some growth retardation with multiple systemic abnormalities. So the clinical picture doesn't really differ markedly with uh, the complete mole, but it can be confused with a threatened or even a missed abortion because of the presence of fetal parts, the past vaginal bleeding, and uh, so on and so forth. So women with partial or incomplete molar pregnancies would tend to have them uh, will present a bit later on than those uh, with complete moles. And of course, the levels of the beta HCG are not as markedly raised as compared to with those with complete moles. When you do a sonographic um, ultrasound, 
then you may see that there is a partial mole. You, generally, the uterus will not even be large for dates, and the potential of malignancy is very low as compared to the complete mole. And the progression is about 10% for it to becoming malignancy. So once the diagnosis is actually made um, and the fetus is not alive, we can terminate the pregnancy. Even if the fetus is alive, the patient should be warned that there may be risks that may be involved with this pregnancy if it is continued. So they should be advised to terminate the pregnancy. Then when it comes to the incomplete mole, remember that post-termination follow-up protocols should be the same as that of complete moles. Well, I'll talk about those later on in the chapter or rather in this video, and as there's a chance of malignancy um, is much less, so the follow-up for three to six months is to be continued after the HCG levels are returned to normal. So here's an ultrasound of a complete mole. You can see that there's this um, thing that looks like a fetus here. I don't know if uh, what we are looking at here is a gestational sac, and you may have some amniotic fluid inside there. So you also have a honeycomb appearance of the placenta sometimes, which I will show you on the next subsequent um, slides. So here's a comparison between a complete mole versus an incomplete mole. So in a complete mole, the ovum is empty. In a partial mole, the ovum is normal. In a complete mole, the genetic material is all paternal. And then on the other side, it could be both maternal and paternal. Then the genotype is 46 chromosomes where you have XX, which is accounting for 85%. You can sometimes have 46XY, sometimes you can just have 45X. And then on the partial mole, you have XXY, XYY, triple X, uh, where you have two spermatozoa fertilizing one normal egg. Then the embryo in fetus is not, uh, is not present in complete mole. It is present in the partial mole, but it's usually non-viable. Then you also get this hydropic um, degeneration of villi that's pronounced and diffused in complete mole. It may be variable in focal in partial moles. There may be some trophoblastic hyperplasia that may be diffused in complete moles. It may be focal in partial moles. And then of course, the uterine size is large for dates in about 30 to 60 percent of the cases usually in partial moles it's actually less than the actual date then you may have some fecal luteal cysts that are very common in complete moles that's only because the beta icg levels are very high usually the beta icg levels are greater than 50,000 international units and then it's very uncommon uh, in partial moles and it's slightly elevated but less than 50,000 there are classical symptoms of complete moles. Those your early onset uh, preeclampsia, your hyperemesis gravidarum, passing out of the grape-like uh, vesicles from the vagina as well as vaginal bleeding. These are quite rare in partial moles. Then, of course, the risk of progression to persistent gestational trophoblastic disease is 20%, while in partial moles, it's less than 5%. Then we'll talk about placental site tumors before we look at further management of this condition. So this is usually a histological diagnosis. So here you have syncytial trophoblastic cells that are generally absent. And so there's going to be a persistent low levels of serum as well as urinary beta ACG. So the tumor is going to be arising from these intermediate trophoblasts of the placental bed. And it's obviously going to be consisting mostly of the cytotrophoblast. Then the patients are going to present with vaginal bleeding. There may sometimes be local invasion into the myometrium as well as the lymphatics and the placental site tumors are not responsive to chemotherapy. So usually hysterectomy is the preferred uh, treatment modality. And then when you talk about malignant gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, this is just simply uh, gestational trophoblastic tumors which can develop in three categories. So you have the non-metastatic disease where the condition is localized to the uterus. Usually the cure rate is about 100%. So if you remove that, then it's well and good. And then you have those that have a good prognosis, but they have metastatic disease where there's distance met, metastasis especially to the pelvis or the lungs, the cure rate is above 95%. And then with those that carry a poor prognosis is where you have this distant metastasis to the brain or the liver. And then where you also have high levels of serum beta ACG that are greater than 40 thousand you also have uh, greater than four months from the antecedent pregnancy as well as following a term pregnancy the cure rate is usually about 65 percent so here is everything that i've been talking about so here with the non-metastatic and the good prognosis you may use a single agent chemotherapy to uh, tackle that usually we follow up uh, one year with the oral contraceptive pills and then after that you follow them up until the beta ACG is uh, negative then with a poor prognosis you usually use multiple chemotherapeutic agents we follow them up for five years on oral contraceptive pills some clinical findings like i already told you so most molar pregnancies will carry will miscarry spontaneously they may present with pain as well as vaginal bleeding so the most common uh 
symptom is bleeding prior to 16 weeks of gestation and you have the species of passing vesicles or grape-like tissue from the vagina. So other symptoms are going to be associated with increase in beta-ACG, things like hypertension, so you have early onset preeclampsia, you may have hyperthyroidism, hyperemesis gravidarum, you may even have anemia that is very extreme, and then of course you, you may not uh, appreciate their fetal heart tones. So most common signs is going to be of course an increase in the fundal height, which is larger than the date, you maybe have absent feet or heart. Then you may have um, the, the bilateral cystic enlargement of the ovaries, something that we refer to as a thecal luteal, thecal, theca luteum cyst. You may also have uh, sites of uh, distant metastasis, such as the lungs. And remember that metastasis to the brain and the liver often carries a poor prognosis. When you make a diagnosis, when you do an ultrasound, you may see a snowstorm appearance in a complete mole. You may see a honeycomb placenta in an incomplete mole. So usually the diagnosis is confirmed by sonography and it's going to be showing this homogeneous intrauterine echoes with or without a gestational sac or without any fetal parts. Then you also get an elevation of HCG, which is usually greater than 100,000 um, million international units per mil. And then 15 to 25% have fecal lutein cysts that can be visualized on the, on the ultrasound. This is obviously due to increase in beta HCG. So here is, um, of course, a sonographic picture of an incomplete mole. You can see the honeycomb placenta over there. Then this is the fecal staging of the disease. So if it's confined to the uterus, you, you put that as fecal stage one. If it ex extends outside the uterus but is limited to the genital structures, meaning the adnexa, the vagina, and the blood ligament, you refer to that as stage two. If it's as extended to the lungs without, with or without involvement of the GIT tract, you put that as stage three. If it's involving other metastatic uh, sites, such as the brain and the liver, you refer to that as stage four. So the management is obviously depending on whatever is underlying, but you want to obtain a baseline quantitative beta ACG titer, so take your beta ACG levels. You want to obtain a chest x-ray to rule out any metastasis. You may see some coin lesions sometimes if these metastasis to the lungs. You want to do your ABO and RH cross-matching. Of course, if this woman is rhesus negative, do not forget to give her anti-D. So ideally, you can perform a suction, uh, a suction dilatation and curettage uh, to evacuate the uterine um, contents and, of course, send them to histopathology. Do not forget to cover this woman on antibiotics post this procedure. Then of course place the patient on an effective contraceptive or contraceptive pills for the duration of the follow-up and um, ensure that there is no confusion because sometimes this woman can fall pregnant and then there can be a rise in the beta HCG such that you may not know if this is actually a recurrent disease or a normal pregnancy which is why we usually put them on some form of contraception. So the treatment is based on the histology as well as the location of metastasis. So with the benign gestational trophoblastic neoplasias, we can actually follow them up with weekly serial beta ACG titers until they're negative for three weeks. Then we follow them up monthly till the titers are negative for one month or rather 12 months. Then we follow them up for a year. If the serial beta ACG titers plateau or they rise and the patient is diagnosed with a persistent gestational trophoblastic disease, they may undergo a metastatic workup where you want to take CT scans of the brain, the thorax, the abdomen, and the pelvis, and you manage them as below. Then if they have non-metastatic or a good uh, prognosis for metastatic disease, you admit a single agent such as methotrexate or actinomycin D until... Uh, the weekly beta HCG titers are going to become negative for three weeks. Then you follow them monthly till the titers become negative for 12 months. Then again, you follow them up for one year. So that's the total follow-up is going to be for one year. Then uh, poor prognosis with metastatic disease usually administer multiple agents of chemotherapy, which are going to include drugs like methotrexate, actinomycin D, cytoxin, until the weekly beta HCG titers become negative for three weeks. Then we do with them monthly and for two years, and then every three months for the another three years. So usually the follow-up for these with poor prognosis is done for five years. So the beta ACG titers is of course for baseline for future comparisons. Your chest x-rays to rot any lung meds. As you can see, there may sometimes be some coin lesions over there on this x-ray that may show distant metastasis to the lungs. You do a suction D and C uh, to empty the uterine contents and then put, place this patient on oral contraceptive pills for at least a year to prevent any confusion from the recurrent disease as well as uh, other uh, normal pregnancies if they do indeed decide to fall pregnant. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this medical review video episode on molar pregnancy. If you enjoyed, drop a like, drop a comment, show some support, share the page, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. We'll leave no one behind.